technology, diversity, wine, the redwoods, and everything in between. Welcome to the Northern California Bay Area, and one show takes you inside the real estate that makes it all happen. This is By the Bay. Hey everyone, and welcome back to By the Bay. I'm your host, Dan Anchetta, and I am really grateful that you're here. And as a reminder, please do like and follow us on social media, on Instagram, and please uh, like the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you might be listening or watching to this. Um, today, I have an awesome guest, uh, Ashley Miller from Windsor Mortgage is here. And uh, Ashley and I have just met for the first time today, but we've been following each other on social for some time. And uh, she's an account executive at Windsor Mortgage, which is a um, a bank in South Dakota. Yep, South Dakota. Cool. Yes. So tell us about that. That's a new role for you. It is. Yeah. yeah. So and get right up on the microphone. Two, okay. <laughs> Better. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so Plains Commerce is the bank that's in South Dakota, okay. and then Windsor is the mortgage arm of Plains Commerce Got Bank. It. So, so essentially, it's a DBA of Plains Commerce, but cool. it's the mortgage division. I joined at the end of July, beginning of August, so it's still pretty new. Uh, but I, when I was a broker, Windsor was one of the lenders that we brokered to. Right, because so, your background is in actual production, correct. and you worked for a local uh, broker shop, here, yep. GTG Financial. Yep. Right. GTG Financial. Nice. And so there were uh, Windsor was one of the uh, banks that you were brokering to. Yep. Okay. Yep. They and later we'll talk our... about the difference between brokers and bankers and that stuff. But sure. keep keep going with your your background and your story. Yeah. So they were one of our wholesalers, and they were in our top five in our rotation at many times top three, many times they were our number two. And we uh, forged a great relationship with them. And I was always in admiration of how they ran their business and how they treated their clients and their customers and just loved the culture of the company. And so it was something where I always just felt very grateful that we were aligned to do business with them. And then when the opportunity presented itself for me to join them, it felt like that was the move I needed to make. That was where I needed to be. And so I joined, like I said, at the end of July, beginning of August, and it's been phenomenal. The transition's been so great. I am loving that I get to work with brokers that I have networked with over the last five, six, seven years. Um, I am working with my friends now. I get to help support my friends and just on a much larger scale than what I was doing before. And I would say it's it's been a easy transition in the sense that I'm already familiar with Windsor. I already know their products because we brokered to them. I already know kind of how they do their business, you know, because, you know, we were doing business with them. And so it was just a seamless transition to move over there. Nice. And so your role there as a account executive or AE or whatever mm -hmm. we're calling it um, is you are helping the individual loan officers that are, are brokers yep. and they are calling you when they need help structuring a loan or putting a deal together to understand what Windsor's guidelines are and to make sure that the loan that they're presenting to you, because they they talk to the client, they package up. Wow. Siri. Siri. Hello, Siri. <laughs> Siri wants in. This is, this is the <laughs> podcast life. Yeah. Um, uh, so they, they are the, the loan officer that's out somewhere in the country is talking to the client mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they are collecting the package and they're sending it into to Windsor. Correct. Right. Yep. And your underwriters are underwriting the loan <clears throat> and decisioning it and conditioning it, making sure that it meets the guidelines for the bank. Yes. Right. Correct. So your job is the liaise between the loan officer and the bank yep. and to help them structure the loan. Mm -hmm. so that it meets the guidelines. Yep, help them structure it so it meets the guidelines. Um, I'll help them price. Uh, and that's when there is a deal to be done. And then it's also a lot of proactive work too. So I am out there educating my clients on what types <clears throat> of products we do have. Right. What is the market wanting right now? Where is our sweet spots? Where are we excelling right now? And then I also take it further because I have a background in marketing that I help with marketing techniques, um, what can we implement? What can I help you implement to grow your business too as well? And so while a lot of it is loan management and product management, it's also making sure that I am giving my accounts the tools to succeed too as well. Got it, that's really interesting. So you have an incentive to help the loan officers that you work with that understand the products and are like proactively selling the Windsor mm -hmm. products to help them grow market share, mm -hmm. help them win more business, right. and showing them the different things that maybe they're not utilizing within the 
product suite yep. to help them utilize those those more to do deals that may, they may not otherwise do. Right. Right. Yep. So not to get too far into the weeds, but I, what I kind of want to focus on, since you talked to so many different um, loan officers in different markets and such, the best of the best loan officers that you're helping right now, what are they doing differently or what products are they using? What's the trend that you're seeing that they're that they're utilizing because the market's hard. Sure. Right? Yeah. So what what are you seeing out there in the market that's the helping loan officers win? You know, I don't necessarily know that it's one specific product because product and pricing is gonna move in and out of the market no matter what type of market we're in, sure. no matter what year it is. Same for 2020, 2021. Um, that's always gonna be something that's fluid. But I think right now what I'm seeing, which is is lending itself to so much success for the brokers that are consistently still doing business through a market like this is they're on their database. That's a gold mine. And they're working their database, they're working their sphere, and they're continuing to just nurture and deepen relationships that they've curated over the course of a couple of years. Okay. Um, I think it's easy for a lot of people to forget just how much success you can get just by simply working your database, whether it be automation, so you're, you know, have them on a, some sort of campaign where they're getting an email every week, or they're getting a newsletter, or, you know, they're getting a, hey, here's what's going on at Sequence Mortgage. Um, and Nice name drop there, calling, by the way. I appreciate that. <laughs> of course. <clears throat> you're calling your database, too, and you're checking in. You know, you're not necessarily calling them to say, hey, you know, can I do a mortgage for you today? You're calling to ask about their kids. You're calling to ask about their vacations. You're calling to talk to them about what's going on in, in their life. And through a lot of this is how you build trust. And then people want to work with people that they like and trust. And so that then turns into business by just simply having a presence in your database and your sphere and your network. So, I mean, I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> I guess my, my what I'm curious about is how do you, are you helping loan officers do those things? Like, because that is the name of the game right now. Sure. Is that someone who's got a, a 3% interest rate on a house that works for them isn't, doesn't need you right now. Right. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to them. No. Right. So how are you, like, are you coaching your loan officers? Like, hey, yeah, we offer this product and yes, this is what we do. But also like, what are you doing to nurture your database? Yeah. And yeah. I will, I'll coach them on that. I'll offer tips and suggestions. Um, I send out uh, like, you know, lead trackers and things like that to anyone that might feel like they need more accountability when they're making these calls or where to start. Um, I'm a big fan of themed days. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, each day has a theme and the theme is going to dictate who you're calling and, and why maybe. So for example, like Friday, today's Friday would be your VIPs, right? So these are clients who have used you consistently and you can set that parameter, whatever you want. Maybe yeah. it's somebody who's closed two or more deals with you is considered a VIP <coughs> right. or somebody who has referred sent, a certain number of deals to you. Exactly. And so Friday is your VIP calls and you just call them and you just say, Hey, I just want to let you know, I'm really grateful for you. You were one of my VIPs. Thank you. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend, you know, whatever it might be. Right. Um, and so I will give my accounts these tools and I will give them reminders. And so something that I do for my accounts is a biweekly almost newsletter that's just broken into bullet points, easy to read, easy to digest, but a tip of the week, right? So maybe the tip this week is you need to send out 25 handwritten cards. Who can you send out a card to this week? Who comes to mind? And it doesn't even need to be maybe, you know, it could be your florist. It could be your doctor. It could be anyone that you're grateful for. Yeah. Your kid's teacher, yeah. like anyone that you're grateful for. So identify who you want to send these cards to. And that's your theme of the, of the day. That's your tip of the day today. Whether or not they take these suggestions, that's on them, right? They've, sure. they've got to hold themselves accountable to do these kinds of things. But I will absolutely coach them if needed. Um, and I do feel it's necessary because I think even the best of the best, we all need reminders sometimes of where we yeah. can improve on. You know, what's 1% that we can improve on every single day? For sure. It's And it's the accountability we're, in, we're going through business planning season right now. Mm -hmm. And every year we go through these, through these exercises and it's great to have a plan, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, we're going to do this and these are the people I'm going to talk to and here's how we're going to do it. And that's wonderful. That it's an absolutely necessary step. Everyone should take inventory of what's happened in the last year and where they stand and what's important to them and mm -hmm. what their why is and revisit those conversations and then put together a written plan about what they're going to do for mm -hmm. next year. Totally huge believer in that. Where I think there's a disconnect, and this is, I, I believe it to be part of the personality profile of who gets into this industry, mm -hmm. is that we're all 
you know, like ADHD, like I'm literally ADHD, like so like diagnosable ADHD. Sure. But I, I think that's like a part, like a, like a, a personality profile that most people have is like they, um, they have big vision and they, they want to go out there and, and talk and sell and do all these things. But the, like the more boring part of the job, mm-hmm. right? Like the, the, the grinding it out type yeah. of the job, we don't really excel at that. Right. Right. So like <clears throat> where, where I feel the business planning falls short is in the execution and the accountability. Mm-hmm. So can you talk a little bit about, and maybe just not in your current role, but just in your experience in the industry, sure. like what's the best way that you've helped loan officers with that actually doing the plan instead of just coming up with the good ideas? Yeah, and you know, that's been a struggle because um, I did manage a team of loan officers. And I will say one of the biggest things like you already mentioned that people struggle with is accountability. Um, for me, I always took the approach that it's not my job to hold you accountable or to motivate you. I have to help you find what motivates you, find your why, and then that will hopefully hold you more accountable. I can give you all the tools. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? So sure. I can give you all the tools, but now it's up to you to actually work these tools. And when you do have somebody who is, you know, I've got a loan officer that I used to work with that would take literally everything I gave to him and he would implement it and he would run with it. And that was my proof of concept. He was my success story. And so I would take examples of that and be like, hey, look, something as simple as me telling him to post on social media, you know, just once a day got him a lead. Right. So these things do work. And here's the proof of concept. And so a lot of it would be, you know, you have to be able to show that this stuff works. Right. I can't just be talking to somebody and instructing them on what to do if I can't show you that the fruits of that labor are going to pay off. Right. There has to be some sort of success, success behind that. Right. So it would be kind of sharing that, yeah. um, sharing my own experiences. I've been in the industry for, for a long time. And now at this point, you know, what has worked for me too as well. And I can, I can prove that to you. I can show you what has worked for me. And then the other part of it too is someone who wants the accountability and can't quite hold themselves accountable, I will literally put them on a phone call with me every week or every two weeks, whatever we feel is necessary, and we'll check in. And I want to see that you're hitting certain milestones. I want to know that you're putting the work in because if you do the work and you stay consistent, consistency compounds on itself. There will be results that come from it. It's like that creating new habits idea. Yeah. I think all of that, I like all that. And and one of the other things is making sure the strategies that you want to implement like are part of something that you are capable of doing sure. like is in your personality right right like i'm not a cold caller like i could probably learn how to do it right, right. and practice it and get good at it but it's not a natural skill set of mine right it's not mine either <laughs> so that's not a good strategy for me right 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 so like picking strategies that like understanding yourself and taking inventory of like, who am I? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What am I good at? What do I suck at? Right. And being real with those items. And then, and then choosing the strategies and the initiatives that like will actually work for Mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And I would tell people all the time, you know, you don't have to take everything I'm telling you. Right. And pick out a couple good things. There's a thousand ways to do business in this industry. Take what works for you, what feels comfortable. Um, You know, for me, I'm huge with social media. Right. You mentioned it earlier. Yeah, let's go into that. Like strategies that work, right? So, social media, that's a strategy. Social media for me is like, it's not 100% of my strategy, but it's a huge piece of it. And I think sometimes people, when they hear this stuff, they think like, well, I now need to ditch what I've been doing and now now I need to cold call. That's the secret to success. Or now I need to pump social media. That's the secret. And it's like, no. It's a piece of the pie, right? right? It's it's part of the puzzle. And I agree with you. If something doesn't come natural to you, you're going to come off so inauthentic when you're doing that. Right. Like if I I do not cold call either. I don't like it. Right. I like a warm introduction. Um, and social media kind of gives me that, right? So you Because you have a presence on there. You've sure. either connected with someone uh, through Messenger or you've commented on a post. They've commented back. You know, there's some form of warm interaction there. But if I just pick up the phone and I call someone, I'm going to stutter. I'm going to stumble on my words. Um, I'm probably going to, if you throw me a question out of left field and I get stuck, I'm going to get flustered. It just doesn't come off genuine. And I'm not a fan of scripts either. But I know plenty of people who do do that and it does work for them. It totally can work. And so I will still tell people, hey, I have access to give you these things. You know, here's a script if you want a script, if you're going to call people for refinances, here's a script you can take, you know, use it if you want to use it. But don't make that the sole 
point of your business at this point and take these things and I would say learn them and become comfortable with them before you start implementing something brand new. So someone who's getting in the business right now, you know, I would say get your Facebook profile up, get your Instagram profile up and start, you know, building your database. I I think of social media like a database. So start building your database on social media, start posting consistently. Um, and then you can you can take the next step to you know a podcast or a YouTube channel, but you're not going to come in and have a YouTube channel, a podcast, a this, a that, all these things, right. and be good at all of them right away. Or you might do a couple of episodes and then stop. Sure, right? you don't want to yeah. do that. You don't do that. So, um, it's just a question that came to my head. At what point do you recommend that loan officers like connect with their prospects or clients on social? Is that like uh, immediately? Meet with, immediately. So yeah, introduced to a new prospect yesterday. Mm-hmm and I'm researching who they are. We had a 15 minute kind of intake conversation. Mm -hmm. They know what they need to do. I kind of have an overall picture of what their finances look like. Are you connecting with them on social right now? Immediately. Wow, okay. Yeah. Not That's not too forward. I mean, I, for me, I don't think so because it's to me, it's it's non-invasive. Right. If they can decline the request if they want. Right. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, but why wouldn't I, right? Yeah. When I can post educational content on social media and say this person comes to you today and you take their application but they don't quite yet qualify they got some work they got to do whether it's save a little money work on the credit whatever it might be and we're six months to a year down the road now that they're going to buy a house but why would you not want to have that presence in front of them as you're posting on social media daily multiple times a day you know why not stay connected in that in that Form. Makes total sense. And I mean, so, that's, where the, that's where their attention is, yeah, like, more so than anywhere else. People get on, and I'm sure you do it. I know I do it. When I'm bored, I'm scrolling, right? Like, it's it's kind of a, it's a it's just something I do. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the water to boil on the stove, and I've just, I've got a minute or two, and I'm scrolling on social media. There's so many studies that show that people are on it when they get up in the morning, as they take their lunch break, and then in the evening before they settle into whatever evening routine that they're in, they're they're active on social media. There are times that you have a captive audience. Why not maximize that? And again, if they don't want to interact with you, if they don't want to accept their friend request, that's fine. Yeah. No one's, don't think mute no one's you. hurting anyone. tired of seeing you. Yeah, your, uh, exactly. People get so posts. worried about that. And to me, you know, I would say if you're concerned with possibly – irritating your audience by over posting well you know they can unfollow you but there's also going to be for one person that's maybe irritated by all these posts two or three people who are gaining value out of those posts and i think you know in our business everything's so integrated Mm -hmm. like our my personal life and business life get get mixed up all the time right right and clients become friends and friends become clients and so I think having that mix of because that's what makes you real. That's right. where you create affinity with people. Right. When they know you far beyond Dan, the mortgage guy. Yep. You know, you're Dan with a family. You've got children. You guys like to, you know, travel on the weekends or whatever it is that people get to know about you. Yep. That's where people start to feel like they can trust you. Right. And you, you become an authentic person. Mm-hmm. And instead of, and I think that's one. So there's lots of good things that happened in our industry during the pandemic and all this stuff. I think one of the bad things is that it became a lot less personal. Like we, when we signed the lease for this office, the whole design was to have a place because my clients, every single client was coming in to meet me in person and they would bring their kids. We set up Mm. like a living room so the kids can go play Xbox and be entertained or watch TV. And then the parents can come and sit with me at a round table and like like a kitchen table essentially and sit and talk, right? Yeah. That's how we designed the office and every office is supposed to have this thing. And then the pandemic hit before we can even open the doors. Like we signed our lease here like in February of 20. Oh yeah. And so like the lockdown happened in March and then like I, I could probably count on two hands, the total number of clients who come in to meet with us in almost four years. Yeah. Right. So like our, our, the business changed dramatically. Sure. And it's all about that digital presence and how are you connecting, you know, like I do a lot more texting and zoom calls than face-to-face meetings. Yeah. And I think that there is something to be said about the positives that did come out of stuff like that, because we all pivoted and learned sure. how to how to integrate more technology. And 100%. when with that, you can reach more people. I can do a Zoom with somebody in Florida, right. you know, and I might not be able to be there in person, but we get some sort of personal interaction. For sure. But I do think for me, like 
having the clients physically oh, come into the office yeah. and like getting to see the pictures of my family on the wall mm-hmm. and we talk about things that are not related to their financing and we're talking about you know life and experience and how is this purchase going to impact the rest of their life and mm-hmm. how did this this has to play into the rest of their financial their plan, strategy right? and their yeah. plan and are they planning on having children are they like like what is the like overall what is your life going to look like and yeah. how can i help support you um i feel like we still do that right that's one of our objectives but it's it's not quite as intimate and personal when right. it's via a totally. phone call or a digital you know connection yeah right? so um yeah so i think i'm just thinking about this like okay so connecting with them on social and having some type of intentional strategy to not just post mortgage stuff but sure. to post some of that personal stuff yeah. so people can see like you're a real person exactly like a real family and yeah stuff right i mean you know mortgages are boring to people no, that wait <laughs> i don't know people don't actually news. want a mortgage yes <laughs> um, they, they want a house if you're not actively in the market for a home purchase or you're not in the industry people typically aren't looking for you know some sort of mortgage right. related content right i mean it is what it is right i real love estate, the industry yeah, you love real estate yes they want to sure, know what the value of their to, house is yeah and, and you realtors get to show beautiful home tours yeah. and things like that i mean we all grew up watching hgtv right because we love to look at real estate we sure. love to like pull back the curtain and see inside a home i mean it's it's just the, that part of it is the fun part right you want the dirt, not the debt. <laughs> and so mortgages for people, y- it can get lost if all you're doing is talking about mortgage strategy, right? Um, and so interjecting some of those personal elements into it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I go to a conference and there are brokers there that I have been connected with on social media for quite a while, but maybe we don't interact that much, right? And I get to these conferences and people are coming up to me and they're like, oh my gosh, how are your kids? You know, they pay attention to stuff like that. Sure. And those are the conversations we have. They want to know about my children. They want to know how their sports are going. They want to know about the vacation we just took. Those are things that they want to they want to talk about. And then at some point, you know, business does come up. But typically we don't start off. We don't go to the conference and shake hands and say, hey, how did that, you know, mortgage article <laughs> work out for right. you? You know, it's, here's it's, a current rate on a 5-1 yeah, arm. Like no exactly. one is talking about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, no, I think it's really important that we think about those and like if you're creating your business plan right now to think about what your digital presence looks like and make Mm -hmm. sure that it's clean and make sure that it makes sense for your brand and that it's resonating with your audience and to like go back and through your feed and make sure that it's not just all mortgage stuff that is relevant to who your audience truly is right and that's like either a realtor like attracting realtor partners or other referral partners or end users Mm -hmm. like actual consumers of the of the mortgage product Mm -hmm. and making sure that that your overall presence represents that. Like, I hate it when I click on someone, a loan officer's feed, and it's all the canned messages oh, uh-huh. from their marketing department. Yeah, like they, they, there's, no there's no personal anything there. It's just like the, you know, scrolling graphics. It's yeah. so frustrating. Right. To me. Like, like we could do better, guys. Come on. Yeah, and I mean, I could talk about social media like for hours. That sounds like another podcast. Episode. It might be. Yeah, you know, but th- there's a aspect to social media too that. I think people forget uh, the word social and social media. You know, it's meant to be a, a social network. Yeah, and so why not yeah. Why not do it? So to get back to what you originally asked was, when do you friend your clients? Yeah. I mean, immediately. We're already socializing. You're already calling me about a need. You might be sitting down in front of me or maybe we're on the phone or whatever, but we're already socializing. So why would I not add you to my social network? Right. All right. Well, that's that. That puts a stamp on that and yeah. now we know to friend our, <laughs> our clients immediately yep. what other strategies are working right now that you're seeing like like I said earlier you're talking to you know loan officers all over the country mm-hmm. right so it's interesting to me because different markets are having different experiences mm-hmm. some are cra- contracting some have more new construction than others some are you know like where we are there's not a lot of new construction or growth so we have limited inventory and you know prices continue to go up and mm-hmm. at yeah, anyway, so what are you seeing work for loan officers today in this current market? Yeah, so beyond utilizing the database and utilizing social media for you know networking, marketing, all that kind of stuff, um, I've seen a lot of loan officers are hosting courses and classes 
whether it be for a realtor team or a home buyer. They're, they're alternating between them. And they're getting out and they're educating. Because right now, I think knowledge is power. And I know I hate to sound so trite when I say that, but it's true. Right now, everyone is so thirsty for knowledge because we are getting it from the media. You're getting it from your uncle. You're getting it from, you know, your dad, your mom, you know, and we call those unreliable sources. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And there's truth to some of what you see in the media. There's truth to the articles that you're reading and things like that. But everyone's situation is so unique and different. Right. And the motivation for purchasing a home is going to be different for everybody. So while you're right. seeing a mass generated, you know, broadcast, it 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 doesn't quite get down to the details of what it is what is it that you need to be educated on when it comes to purchasing a house? What right. loan products do you need to know you have access to? I mean, veterans, what what's the number? Fifty eight percent of veterans don't even know that they have a VA loan benefit. Is that real? Fifty eight percent. I think so. I think one of the last times I could be making it up, but it's a pretty pretty high number. Maybe it's between 30 to 40 percent, but it's a pretty high number um, that don't realize that they have a VA benefit that they can use. Well, and that's a whole stigma that has to be overcome. Totally. People think that using a VA loan is hard. Right. And they think that it's expensive and it's like couldn't be further away from the truth. And especially I've seen way more disability ratings on mm-hmm. on certificates of eligibility, not to get too far down into the mortgage you know, terminology here, but where there's no funding fee for a lot of veterans that we're yeah. working with, like maybe half have some type of service-related disability. Yeah, um, if not maybe more. I feel like majority of the clients that we've worked with yeah. are, are rated. And so it's the education piece of it right now that I think the loan officers that are out there that are either hosting in person or they're doing yeah. webinars, um, you know, they're the ones that are positioning themselves as an expert, right. and you are the resource for for the knowledge that people are so in right. need of right now. Are you seeing loan officers creating these presentations on their own? Are they using a service, or what is what is what is the prevailing? I would of? say most have done it on their own, uh-huh. um, but at, we all. Everyone is so great about sharing different resources. And so I've seen, you know, in some of the Facebook groups that I'm in, someone will create a PowerPoint and they'll pop it in there to share and someone can pull it out and they can, yeah. they can you know, modify it and brand it to themselves or add info, take away info, whatever they may. They may. Yeah. Um, I do know really there cool are some to do that. services like, yeah. out there that do do that. Um, I think that most of the brokers that I talk to are probably making these things themselves. From what I've seen, it's, it's a lot of, you know, presentations and stuff that they've put together themselves. And sometimes too, it's based on a specific need. You know, don't just assume that that your agents need this info. Ask them. Ask them what they want to learn about. Right. You know, um, a lot of them, you know, two one buy down was a big thing for a while. And it, I mean it still is, but when it first came out, nobody really knew how it worked or what it was. Yeah. So and so ask your agents, you know, what can I educate you on? Right. And then create a plan based around that. And a lot of these two will build on themselves. And so I, I have a couple loan officers that I know that do these in like a series. They'll do yeah. them in like a three-part series. We'll start here, come to the next one, come to the next one. When you complete your three-part series, here's your home buying manual or whatever. And, you know, you got to give something of value to these people who are giving you their time too as well. Um, and so the ones that are do- out there and doing that right now, I've seen have been able to sustain their business and get a lot more visibility from the market in doing so because they're positioned as the trusted expert. Right. Yeah. I, I, we teach classes here. And we generate most of the content mm-hmm. on our own. Um, <clears throat> I do have also seen some of those posts where people will post the PowerPoint that they mm-hmm. make and then there's some AI tools that yeah. you can just upload that presentation, tell yep. it to use your colorway and your logo and it will repurpose and mm-hmm. kind of do it for you. And then, uh, and then you can go and like modify it to be mm-hmm. kind of more in your voice and add some other things to it, um, which is a great time saver. I know that for me, like really trying to create content that is unique and interesting and actually helps our partners with their business, mm-hmm. it takes a lot of intention. It does. Right? And so like some of these presentations, I'll take 20, 40 hours to create a hour and a half or two hour long, mm-hmm. you know, lunch and learn type of presentation, mm-hmm. right? And there's nothing worse than doing all that and having two people show up. Yeah, <laughs> it's. I mean, it's heartbreaking because yeah. I'm like, but the content is so good. Yeah. Why? How can loan officers, in your opinion, right? Mm-hmm. How how can loan officers 
connect more with realtors and show them that like we we are a resource that's underutilized in their business and mm-hmm. to really get into like the partnership mm-hmm. part of the business as opposed to being like a vendor. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a great question because um, I feel like even more so this year, that's a little tougher because yeah. the market is just constricted so much. There is it's there's just so much competition. Right. And uh, but, you know, it it can be one of those things where maybe you have two people that show up, but you still going to nail that presentation. Oh, I, and I go. I'm I mean, sure which yeah, you do. We, we yeah. like we don't cancel it because there's only two people. But and then you say to them, it's yeah. just like you would ask for a referral. You yeah. know, who could benefit from this info? Please go to your broker and let them know that you really enjoyed this right. today. Or, or, you know, please go, um, you know, give this info to your, you know, your realtors and, and ask that they, you know, come join us for the next one because this is valuable information. Um, outside of that, because I don't want to tell people, hey, just go ahead and put it all out there and then, you know, wait for two people to show up. That's not the strategy. You yeah, know, we right. want to put butts and seats. the, the like, one to many Exactly. Having a room full of people to present to. Um, I think before you, so you have to have an action plan when you're planning an event. You can't just decide, I'm going to do an event, it's going to be next week, and we're going to get the invites out. Uh, There needs to be, there's actual, it's called a YAP, a yearly action plan, which actually walks you through the sequence, just like we have a sales sequence, it walks you through the sequence of planning a proper event and how to actually invite people and get them there. So utilizing social media, one, so when you create your invite, put that out on social media, um, send an email campaign to everyone that you want to invite, encourage them to invite others. Um, I also think that if you put a little bit of a, like a, like seats are limited, so you need an RSVP. Scarcity. Scarcity, that's the word, yeah. People, you know, they wanna be involved in something that's limited, right? So. Um, and then pick up the phone and call too. So people that you're inviting to these events, pick up the phone and call. Um, title reps are often great to help you market these things because they have a huge database right. and they're usually- They know everybody. They know everybody, right? And if I have a question about someone in the market, that's the first person I call is yeah. the, the title rep. Yeah, sure. so it, I would say, you know, follow that sequence of events, right? Use your social media, use your email campaign, get people to RSVP and then pick up the phone and call. Um, and then ask, you know, when, once they do attend, then you ask for that referral too, just like you would at every other business. You would ask for them to either bring a friend to the event, uh, the next one that you host, right? Or um, ask them, you know, make a hashtag for the event and tell them to put it on social media and hashtag the event. So you're just generating more and more interest and people are seeing, you know, what's going on here in your office when you're throwing events like that and stuff. Um, So that would be my advice for stuff like that. And, you know, it does get hard. I always say you don't want to necessarily make the event about, well, I have lunch here today, right? So show up because I'm feeding you. There will be alcohol. Yeah, (laughs) that's going to get everyone there. Um, You know, but maybe something that's going to be worth their time too to show up. So if you're going to do like a lunch and learn, then sure, put food out, right? Um, But then you want to be able to have your value outshine that. So you're not just getting people who are, who are showing. It's just like with realtors with open houses, people walk in for a free cookie, right? right. So you don't right. want people to get used to, oh, I'm going to go here because I'm going to get lunch out of it. Well, no, right. you're going here because I'm about to blow your mind with right. some knowledge. I think like the, the thing to focus for, for like we, we try to focus on is that realtors are being invited to everything, you know, 50 events a month. Yeah. Right. So the, what are you going to do in your event that mm-hmm. make that, that makes it the one or two things that they're going to commit to doing. Yeah. So you have to be different, right? And you've got to stand out. And, you know, maybe you throw an event where it's, um, maybe it's, you you call it, you know, 10 things your mortgage lender hates or 10 things, you know, uh, that I don't like about VA loans or something like that, right? Something that's going to grab their attention. And and then the content, it's not that you don't like VA loans, it's you don't like the stigma behind VA right. loans. You don't like that when we have an offer that we're trying to get accepted, they're pushing back on us because they think the appraisal is going to blow up the Every deal. time. Things like that, right? Every time it's the question. So yeah. something that's attention grabbing, something yeah. that's just not your cookie cutter, like home buying 101, like yeah. um, something that um, is going to, you know, there's a website called Answer the Public. I don't know if you've ever yeah. gone yeah, on it. Great. Um, you know, but see what people, so if you're going to do a home buyer event, go on to answerthepublic.com, see what people are asking about. Yeah, so explain what answerthepublic.com is. So I don't know if I can explain it correctly, but it's an aggregated 
source of the most Googled terms right. for anything, right? So I can, if I put in mortgage, it's going to show me everything that's aggregated on the most searched results right. for what people want to know about a mortgage. Right so now, like it's on, interest rates. When you're like, on Google and you put in, you know, start typing something, it'll like make your make the suggestions. Yes. it's like that, but it's like a whole web of them that yeah. says like, and you can refine it and yep. say, in California, what are people asking about when it comes to mortgages? And it will tell you. Mm -hmm. This is the most searched terms, and this is what they're mm -hmm. searching for. And then you can answer the public those questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you could do that with events, too. Right. Okay. You could take that same concept because we want to be able to give the people what they want, right? right. So, like, we want to be like, able to. a good, like, data driven way to, to, to answer to the question. Yeah. So, be, I think you used the word intentional earlier, yeah. be intentional with it and give value where value is needed. If, I've got an audience of people, if I've got a captive audience over here and they're all FHA buyers, I'm not gonna talk about VA, right? Just I'm just use as an ex yeah, sure. example. I'm gonna give them what it is that they need. Right. So those are some ways that you could probably curate courses and content sure. and things like that that are gonna speak to your audience on what it is that they really wanna know about. Right. Yeah, we're, we have a lot of interest in down payment assistance right. programs right now. And I think a lot of that comes from the hype around like the Dream for All oh, yeah. program. And there's just endless number of, of people who are curious about that. The, um, yeah, the, and I spent a lot of time thinking about like, how do we curate that message, but also attract buyers who are, it's kind of like you're saying, like the, the free food thing earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you, how do you make it? Make sure that you're attracting the audience that's actually actionable, that's going to like do something, as opposed mm -hmm. to people who are just kind of curious to know like how much money are they giving away for free, and right. you know they don't they're not actually super serious about moving forward with that. Right. right. So I think that's kind of a a bit of a trap that we fall into where yeah. I can get I can get the phone to ring, you know, all day. Sure. With people who are not actually prepared mm -hmm. to do something or don't qualify or. Mm -hmm. You know th those types of things. So like making sure that you're focusing in on the on the segment of people who need your help mm -hmm. and are willing to like move forward and mm -hmm. do the thing, mm -hmm. whether that's now or six months from now or a year from now, irrelevant because you don't put them into your sales funnel and yeah, you know, help those people. Yeah, and I think for that too, like you want your audience to have a little bit of skin in the game, uh, and whether that's you know, the ultimate goal would be a loan application, right? Sure. Ultimate goal would be funding the loan. Right. <laughs> but we, yeah. we want to try to get them to, to submit an application because then now they've got a little bit of skin in the game, right? right. They, they've put forth the effort to go on, fill out a 1003. Maybe they're submitting their documents right now. Maybe they're not. But they're, they're actually doing the work to get back to you what it is that you need to start your pre-approval process. And that right there would be a good lead to continue to... To, to pursue, nurture, right? right? Even if they don't qualify right now. And it's, I always and say it's actually fine it's, if you don't qualify. It's not a no, it's right. just a not right now. Right. We have some things to work on. Yeah. We'll put you on a mortgage diet. So we'll work on put that. Put you on a mortgage diet. And by the way, a 1003 for people who don't know is the form number oh, yeah, for sorry. the <laughs> application. Uh, and that's like one of the, that's how we refer to a loan application as a 1003 is actually not that anymore, but yeah. that's okay. I still call it it's that. It's Erla, but that's yep. okay. Um, so uh, kind of wrapping up here, are there other things that, you're seeing in the market, like it could, like I said earlier, it's a tough market. Mm -hmm. And I think we read, there's an article on Housing Wire, like 100,000 loan officers have left the business. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. In the last, since the height in 2021. Yeah. And I think we'll see more at the end of the year oh, yeah. when NMLS turns over. Because the renewals are coming yep, up and you got to pay your 500 up. bucks and mm -hmm. people aren't going to do that. Right. Um, so what other advice do you have for a loan officer maybe right now who might be struggling besides, okay, we've kind of talked about database mm -hmm. and social Mm -hmm. and teaching, leading with education and teaching classes. Is there anything else that you're seeing like the best of the best doing? Um, I don't know that this is necessarily something I'm seeing a lot of people do, but it would be advice that I would give anybody right now. It's to get yourself a network and lean into it. Um, I'm involved in probably you know, one big one, which is AIM. We talked about that earlier. Um, and there's a few little offshoots from that. And like, what's AIM? Um, AIM is the Association of Independent Mortgage Experts. And it started as a broker support group. Um, and not to get too far off in the weeds, but, you know, the crash of 08, a lot of that was blamed on brokers. And What was their fault? Yeah, right? <laughs> like, so it was all the broker's fault. Yes. All the broker's fault. And yeah. so then the industry moved into retail, into banking. Right. We'll call it banking. 
And from there, then the broker movement kind of started back up again, but there wasn't a whole lot of support for brokers. We didn't have things like NAM. You know, I mean, we did, but it wasn't broker specific. Mm-hmm. Um, and so AIM was born as a way to start lobbying for brokers, offering support, um, helping brokers with their business. That's so it's how like AIM an industry got tra- trade group. Industry trade group. Okay. Yeah, that was a much simpler way to put it. Yeah, and there's a bunch of them, right? So there's like the National Association of Realtors, yeah. there's a Mortgage Bankers Association, there's all sorts of different mm-hmm. lobbying groups that, that advocate yeah. for and the industry. This one was broker specific. Okay. So you had to be a broker. So we should talk quickly about the difference between a bank mortgage and a broker. broker and a mortgage banker. Sure. So your bank, your if you work for a bank or if you're a client that goes to a bank, you're going to have one set of products to choose from. That's going to be the bank's products. And then banks fund in house and all that kind of stuff. So that's if you like, want to get that's like that Wells detailed. Fargo. Yeah. So that'll be like your Wells Fargo, your Bank of America. Right. Is. So Wells Fargo sells Wells Fargo loans right. and Wells Fargo rates and that's what they sell. Yeah. You have one rate sheet. Right. So that's like, that's like a retail... The, like consumer bank, like a bank yep. branch. Yes. Because I, I am technically a mortgage banker. Right. The bank that I work for does not take deposits. Right. So we, you're retail. We are, we, are, we are retail. Retail. Mortgage bank. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you, when you work off of your retail line, you've got your one rate sheet and you've got your set of products for that bank. Whereas a broker, we can work with 5, 10, 15, 20 other investors that are going to fund our loans for us. But I've got a different rate sheet for every single lender that I'm working with. And I've got a different suite of products for every single lender that I'm working with. And everyone's got some of the same stuff, right? Your conventional, your govies. Yeah. But then you get into some of the uh, non-QM, which is like your bank statement loans that right. people have probably heard about that, right? Your sure. um, your investment type of lending so and things the, like that. So through the banking channel, we can do that as well. So like sure. we have our in-house New American funding. That's the bank that, that we're uh, affiliated with. Uh, 30-year fixed Fannie Mae loan. Mm-hmm. In addition to that, we have some other specific investors that have their Fannie Mae 30 year fixed loan that might have some slightly different overlays. Yeah, they have, different they have set different of guidelines. Rates, they have different loan level pricing adjustments. They have totally different things. But all of that is done through a correspondent channel where our underwriters underwrite those loans and approve those loans based off that criteria. But we can choose which bank specifically will be owning the loan yep. and servicing the loan going forward. You're getting to choose your investor essentially right. with that. And and we're seeing and that's mostly price driven, yeah. right? Like what's best for the client? We're going to do that, and then we, you know, we also have correspondent, uh, like jumbo non QM loans where we mm-hmm. do bank statement and P and L loans and debt service coverage ratio loans that are not an in house product, but we represent. We have delegated underwriting for another institution's money essentially yeah, right and then in addition to that we have a broker channel so if we have a, a customer who has uh, a need that doesn't fit any of the correspondent loans mm-hmm. in-house products we have a suite of i don't know 75 or 100 mm-hmm. outside brokers where we do the same thing where we take the package we collect it and then we ship it off to them and they underwrite it and now yep. that's what windsor that's what windsor is yes doing, is the broker is yep. the, is the non-delegated brokering. Yeah. So to put it as simply as I can with a broker, essentially the broker is taking the loan application and sourcing who's going to underwrite and fund the loan. And then they send that to that investor, that bank that's going to underwrite and uh, fund that loan. Um, You are like a hybrid model, which is pretty cool because you get to choose the different avenues in which you're going to take your client. Um, Some loan officers who work for some of the banks don't have that option either. Um, And I think the biggest takeaway from all of it is in our industry, there are so many options, yeah. so many ways to do it. Yep. Uh, so Windsor is a wholesale lender. A lot of the terms that you'll hear used most are your retail and wholesale. And those are kind of the two of the main channels that people know about. And if you think about it like, you know, your your retail bank is going to be wholesales like Costco, right? So I can go in and get wholesale prices and product at Costco, um, at a, at a you know wholesale price, I already said that, but at, a, at either a cheaper price, the fees are a bit cheaper, 
um, it's it's a warehouse style type of, of shopping experience. Whereas, or I can go to a store that only carries one set of product, one set of price for something and shop there too as well. And so with your retail, you're going to have essentially one set of rate sheet and products to choose from, whereas with a broker and in your model, you've got all kinds of different options. Right. I can pick and choose where I want to go with this based off of price, service level, and what's available. Yeah, for sure. And, and yeah, so I think there's a, a bit of a delineation between when people say bank, they think, I think my impression is that they think a Wells Fargo branch. Like depository. You walk into a physical branch location mm-hmm. and they are very limited in what they they do because they're only selling the products that are available within that one institution. Right. And I think it's, yeah, so for us, we are a bank. We're not a broker. But you only, can but broker. But I can broker. And we don't just represent one bank. We represent many, many, many banks. Yeah. Right. So we are direct lenders. So we sell directly to Fannie Mae and Freddie and Fannie and Freddie and Ginny and all these other people. Um, and uh, but then we can also go through another institution that might have a slightly different set of rules mm-hmm. and pricing for certain products. We have an investor right now that has much lower loan level pricing adjustments on non-owner occupied conventional loans. Yeah. So all That's of our where the loans, deals are going to go. All of our loans go there yep. you know, if you're buying an investment property because yeah. it's it's like way better. Oh, well, yeah. Um, and you have a duty to your client, right? To, yeah, we have a fiduciary to, duty to yep. advise, and I'll show them, like, here's the different products, and this is the one I suggest that you do. And just so you know, it won't be our company that's servicing this loan. Another company will be will transfer the loan for servicing, but you can't pass up on this deal. Right. Right? So yeah. I'm still here to help you, and you can always call me, and I'll be there. Um, but, yeah, so it's really interesting, and this is maybe a whole different conversation about the difference between bankers and brokers mm-hmm. and the different channels that people go through. And mm-hmm. there's been a big shift of people leaving banks and going to be brokers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of been an ebb and flow of, of people going to these different models. And at its core, we're all selling the same right. product. It right. just really depends on the way that you're delivering it, that like last mile of origination mm-hmm. of like what is the consumer experience and what's the like kind of transparency around how do we choose who gets your loan mm-hmm. and what the cost is mm-hmm. because of, like you said all the fees are slightly different and um and uh and pricing might be slightly different and rate offerings might be slightly different and then if you really dig into the pricing sheets where buy downs cost yeah. different things i mean there's you all sorts so of technical stuff so far stuff. in the weeds yeah. with the nuances yeah. of these things yeah. yeah we should probably do that another full episode about banker and broker yeah. and be curious because yeah, you've been on both sides of that. Yeah, totally. Be, be, be fun to I've, chat that through. I've done both sides of the coin in a very small... When I got in the business, my company had a correspondent line and I, I didn't do a whole lot of work with that correspondent yeah. line. Um, but I my background started as broker and then retail and then back to broker and now wholesale. Yeah. So we could absolutely... Yeah, because my background, I've worked for like retail banks like branches, mm-hmm. like working at Washington Mutual when oh, it was uh-huh. a place, right? Uh, and then got it stayed in the retail banking world and was like taking deposits and doing that sort of thing. And then I've only been on the mortgage banking side. I've never been a mortgage broker. Okay. I have brokered loans. Sure. Right. But I haven't been technically a broker, a broker. Yeah. where you're, I've always been an employee, a W2 employee as opposed to like a 1099 mm-hmm. independent contractor. Um, so it's a very interesting world and there's a lot of dynamics between them. And there's like, I think there's, Within the industry, there's a lot of like kind of headbutting about, you know, this is a better that. channel and that's a better channel. Yeah. And like the reality is that they're both fine. It just depends on like your model and your clients right. and like the, the type of products and clients that you're serv- serving right. and which of those platforms provides the best options for your clients at the end of the day. Yeah. And I will say it's a small portion of clients that have ever said, I prefer to work with a broker over a banker. Right. Or, or do they even know the difference between wholesale and retail? <laughs> right. Um, it, it all goes back to what we were talking about earlier with people work with people that they know, like, and trust. 100%. It doesn't matter what platform you're on. Exactly. If, if you're likable and you have good like communication, have integrity, you take good care of your clients, yep. you'll win the business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I've got friends on both sides of the coin and I, I hate all the, the bashing that goes on sometimes. And I try, I just, I silence it. I say it's, yeah. do, it does me no good to get wrapped up in it because there are so many great loan officers and mortgage professionals on both sides 
of the of the avenue, whether you work for the bank or for the broker, and we can all learn something from each other. Yeah. So why would we not embrace each other? I yeah, don't sure. I don't understand the mudslinging. So yeah. I don't do that. <laughs> It'll be fun. Let's we should talk about it in more detail. Sure. I think it's really good to have that kind of transparency and be yeah. like, this is what they do. This is how we do it. This is how the process overall mm-hmm. works differently, and go from there. I really appreciate you being on the show, yeah, Ashley. It's great me. to have you and uh, to meet you in person and uh, kind of talk to the power of social media to yeah. you know connect with people and and uh, and create create that network. So thanks for being on By the Bay. I appreciate you being here, and we'll we'll have you back again sometime soon. Sounds good. Right, thanks. Stay up to date with Bay Area real estate. Hit subscribe now if you haven't already. Did you enjoy this episode? We love reviews in the Apple Podcasts app. We'll read yours on the show. This is By the Bay. London Ear Media.